Hello, everyone. I hope you've been doing well and getting outside when you can. Today, we'll be talking magpies. <coughs> when observing a black-billed magpie in the wild, two things are abundantly clear. Firstly, the bird is beautiful. Secondly, the bird knows it. Its pompous strut as it hops across the ground just screams, Look at me! Look at me! To the corvid's credit, it's hard not to. Their elegant black and white is stunning, and the iridescent blues and greens of their long tail gleam and shimmer in the sunlight. When the magpie takes flight, its silhouette is reminiscent of a parrot with its diamond-shaped tail and short wings. While they may bear a passing resemblance to a parrot, there is a species that they are virtually indistinguishable from, their Eurasian cousin, the common magpie. The two share a similar name with a peculiar, twisting origin. The term magpie originates from the Eurasian bird's original Greek name, Sissa. This name reflected the variety in the corvid's diet, and eventually morphed into the Latin pica. The word pica is now used in ornithology to denote the magpie's genus, and in the medical community to refer to an appetite for largely non-nutritional foods, once again related to the propensity of the magpie to eat almost anything. As the years progressed, the Anglo-Saxons eventually shortened pica into pie, which then became a universal term for the blotchy black-and-white pattern which adores the black-billed magpie as well as sundry other birds and animals. As for the mag half of the magpie, there is a much simpler origin. It comes from a shortened version of the name Margaret. Odd as it may seem, there was a long tradition in England to give birds human names, such as the Jenny Wren and the Tom Tit. And so, sometime around the 1500s, the name magpie was born. The creature itself is just as interesting as its nomenclature. As stated before, the black-billed magpie will eat just about anything. This diet includes the basics of insects, fruits, seeds, grains, and human refuse. But as an opportunistic omnivore, the magpie has a few more quirks. It can often be seen feeding in cattle fields, both pulling ticks from the back of cows and flipping cow patties over with its beak or foot in search of beetles. They will also kill and eat small rodents when possible, and that pointy beak is perfect for nipping a few bites of meat away from a larger predator's kill. These scavengers can be found throughout much of the grasslands and plains of western North America. Despite residing in relatively open habitat, they tend to live near trees or bushes so that they will have cover from raptors if need be. When in prime magpie habitat, you will almost never see just one. This is because the black-billed magpie is an incredibly social bird with extremely dynamic behavior and family structures. When food is scarce, magpies will nest further away and be more vigilant in defending their territory than in periods of abundance. However, outside threats will always trump the threat magpies pose to one another, and in the chance of a predator, the birds will let out a volley of alarm calls before mobbing it. Another event which brings disparate magpies together is the death of one of their own. When a magpie dies, the others will begin to gather silently around it, observing the body and the surrounding area. Up to 40 birds at once have been observed performing this ritual, which has been referred to as both a funeral and a murder investigation though the exact purpose of the habit is unknown. On a happier note, the breeding season of the black-billed magpie is filled with life. The courtship period begins with a brilliant display from the male, who raises his tail high and begins to chatter. He will occasionally flash and flutter his wings to grab the attention of a nearby female. She will have to think hard about this decision, because as monogamous birds, this will be her partner for the rest of the pair's life. When a pair is formed, courtship continues on the end of the female. She will begin to beg for food both before and after mating, so that she will be able to guard the eggs. But in order to even lay eggs in the first place, a nest is needed. 
This is a responsibility shouldered by both partners. The nest is egg-shaped and can take up to 40 days to construct, and so the work is evenly divided. The female will begin to construct the bottom half, which will include a mud-lined cup in which to lay the eggs, and the male will build the dome-like shield which protects the eggs from above. Occasionally, the couple will disagree on where to build the nest and begin building their halves in separate locations. But since a brood will not survive without cooperation, eventually they meet back up. During the 20-day period in which the mother magpie must incubate the eggs, the father stands at the top of the tree, watching for any threats which may approach the nest, including other magpies. When the one to nine eggs hatch, the chicks are entirely featherless, and will not open their eyes until seven days old. For the next month, they will remain in the nest, slowly developing and being fed by their parents. After fledging, the magpie chicks will stay with their parents for another four weeks before joining larger flocks. The fledgling period for magpies is extremely dangerous, which brings the average life expectancy down to only three years, though they have been recorded as living much longer, up to nine years in the wild and fourteen years in captivity. With good fortune and good decision-making, magpies should live long enough to raise several broods with their partner. Thanks for watching. These birds hold a special place in my heart, as they are the species that first got me interested in bird watching. If there's a species you love and would like to see covered next, let me know in the comments below. As always, my sources for photos and information are in the description if